have found authentic business adventures, a business program that brings you the struggle stories and triumphant successes of business owners across the land. We're locally underwritten by the Bank of Sun Prairie. If you would like downloadable audio episodes of the podcast for free, you can go to drawincustomers.com. Uh, today, we are welcoming slash preparing to learn from Ryan Ogren, the founder of E2E. So Ryan, how is it going today? Yeah, um, well, so I'm not the founder of E2E. Oh, I'm fu- I'm sorry. Well, let's change that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, L- let me change that. Founder of? Rhino LLC. Oh, oh, I don't see that in email. How do you spell it? Um, it's R-H-Y-N-O. H-Y-N-O L-L-C. But, but my real title is a, I'm a private business investor. All right. Yeah. Private business investor. That's a cool name. Professional baseball player private business investor all right gotcha okay professional all right so oh founder what is the e2e thing so that's uh sir darren jacklin's um fundraising event and uh so i i just walked up to him at a, at a random uh, M and A conference, yeah, and I asked him. I was like, "Hey, you know, what what should I be looking to do here?" And um, lo and behold, he just like took me under his wing and and looped me in on this cause. So, Elevate to Educate is an arm of the LY Two NK Foundation, which is uh, helping to build schools in Africa. Um, and Elevate to Educate is an arm of that, a fundraising arm of that, to raise money through hiking fundraisers. Gotcha. All right. Got it, got it, got it. Okay, so we can talk about more of that when we get going here. Yep, yep. So let's just say, oh, uh, we have Ryan Ogren, the founder of Rhino LLC, professional baseball player, as well as, and I love this, the private business investor. So Ryan, how is it going today? Good, good, James. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks for being on the show here. This is cool. You have quite the story, it sounds like. So yeah, all kinds of things going on, professional baseball player into business. You don't hear about that too often. Yeah. So I'm not a professional baseball player at the moment. I retired. Right, right, right. But we're past tense, right? right. Yep. Yep. Right. That's interesting. It's a, it's been a fun ride. I've had a lot of great mentors along the way and uh, just trying to do my best every day, I guess you could say. Sure. So when, let's start with the whole business thing. Did you, well, I guess business versus baseball was the goal to get into baseball and then the business thing just happened in your lap or maybe vice versa <laughs> i don't know yeah i mean so my dream growing up was always baseball um you know if you talk to anybody that was around me you know coming up it was uh i was baseball all the time um and while I was, when i f- finally accomplished my dream um you know i i kind of you know started to think well what's next sure uh, and uh every off season you know baseball you only play when it's warm out um, so every off season, you have to find something to do. And, um, you know, I started doing some, starting some businesses in the off season. I had a wood shop and then, um, had a, a drop shipping company during spring trainings. Um, and so it, it just kind of morphed into this, this small business. And then as soon as I started getting out of baseball, it turned into investing. All right. And what got you out of baseball? Cause I imagine if that's your dream, you want to keep running with it or, yeah. I imagine you can also advance within the baseball. I don't know that world very well at all. So right. Okay. Well, I'll I'll, I'll try and give you some background. So yeah. uh, I played one year with the Seattle Mariners, um, and then I got traded to the Baltimore Orioles. And so when I got traded, I was a shortstop, and the Orioles converted me into a catcher. Oh. Uh, and so as I was going through that that transition into a new position, um, the new coaches and everyone trying to get their hands on me and now I'm le- now I'm learning something completely from scratch which is just you know you have to start from square ro- square one um and uh eventually it just kind of you know you have to start over and there's new guys getting drafted coming in and it's very competitive so I you know I was wasn't even playing my position anymore and they had new guys coming in so I just kind of figured you know what you know I have my business is starting to take off let me just focus on that it's it's you know I've already c- accomplished what I came here to do all right so is the like i'm just curious about the money thing because everybody assumes that professional players are making just boku cash right like they just back up trucks and dump cash but when you're first starting out i don't think that's the case is it 
Well, you have so you have the the draft, right? You have the uh, the MLB amateurs uh, draft, and so that's when you know you make most of your money, and then you know you go to the minor leagues, and you don't really have that much money after that. And then if you're fortunate enough to make it all the way up to the big leagues, then you have you know those big checks. But even then, you know um, they'll send big leaguers up and down, up and down, up and down, and they won't even get to collect min- the full uh, check of minimum. So yeah. Uh-huh. Wow. All right. So there's a point where you're just like, you know what? I'm beating up my body for what kind of thing? Yeah. Well, I was I was actually catching uh, guys throwing 100 miles an hour and throwing <laughs> balls in the third. And, um, you know, after that, after seeing, you know, it was just kind of like, OK, you know, you kind of had a feeling that it wasn't it wasn't meant to be at this point. And uh, um, at that point in time, I was like, all right, let's let's spend this time wisely. Let's use this time to to invest in our future. So yeah. at that moment in time, I knew I had to make that decision and it was tough, but I uh, made it and uh, it was the right thing for me. Nice. Yeah. I, I imagine that would be a tough, if that's a dream, you accomplish it. And then you're kind of like, eh. I feel yeah. like this, you get the Ferrari or you get the Corvette or whatever super speedy, fast car you want. Then you're like, uh, now what? Now what do I do? Hey, right. speeding tickets from here on out. I imagine I'm just, my hand is hurting just thinking of catching a hundred mile an hour fastball. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it, it definitely gets on you quick. All right. Uh, and is the, the scary part is, is blocking. Um, oh. I had to, cause they they expect you to keep the ball in front of the, of home plate. Like you are as a professional catcher, you're supposed to be able to do that. Guys that have been catching their entire lives are able to do that. Someone that's been catching for two months, you know, that was definitely a, a, a interesting spot to be in all right interesting so from a, when we look at it a little bit analytical like a uh, decision making just like you do in business mm-hmm. when you're looking at what the coaches are choosing or deciding to do with you did you understand why they're making those choices or did you think like you guys are making a wrong call here so on paper and you know their thinking is it was spot on you know they're i wasn't too fast um you know as to stay at shortstop i had a great arm and had great hands and great footwork so that makes sense to be behind the plate um and plus you know to play infield in the big leagues you have to hit a lot of home runs that's just where the game's going and right. unfortunately like i didn't really have that crazy power um or I my stats didn't show it at least um but even that i didn't think i had that crazy power all right uh, but so catcher just makes it made sense on paper um, just the, the timing was really tough on me because uh, they told me at the beginning of spring training and gave me two months to learn it before the season. So I was kind of like, OK, this is uh, I'm already <laughs> up against it here, but let's just give it our best shot and we'll see what happens. All right. Interesting. So let's go with uh, to that shifting when you're like, OK, no more baseball, no more professional baseball. You probably play it still for fun kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, what? <laughs> With your businesses and stuff like that, did you just put your businesses on hold while you were playing ball? Well, so uh, the, my my very first business was a wood shop um, that I'd run every off season, and that wood shop was actually very successful. It was I, it was just a nice wood shop. When I say very successful, it was just me, and it worked for me, so I could work whenever I want, and that's how I made my money to live in the off season. Um, didn't do really any advertising for it besides just Instagram referrals. Um, right. And that's much how I got all the business for it. And um, that taught me how to run a business that taught me every process you need to know. Um, and, you know, it was, it was very beneficial, but every time I'd leave to go to the season, I would hold, put that on hold, obviously. All right. And then, uh, so I was starting to think like, how can I still grow something while I'm still playing? Um, and obviously e-commerce comes into play. That's the first thing that everyone wants to do now. Um, and so I looked into, uh, drop shipping from, you know, AliExpress. That's pretty much how I'd source my products. Um, I'd go find them there and then I, you know, create a landing page and advertise for it. And that's, and then I just ship straight from AliExpress to the consumer's doorstep. You know, it's pretty simple business plan and it actually worked for me a little bit. Um, and so I was doing that out of my hotel room during spring training. Oh, wow. So tell me, let's talk about the wood stuff. Were you making furniture or what were you building? Um, so I made, I made pretty much anything. So if, if people asked me to make, you know, a piece of furniture, I just said, yes, 
I didn't, I didn't stop. You know, the, the, the way I got my first order was one of my sister's uh, best friends asked me to make her a shot ski. So it was like a drinking game. You have uh, shot glasses on like a, a ski and everyone gets in line and takes a shot. Oh, funny. Uh, and so I, she asked if I could be able, if I was able to make one. And I just said, yeah. Um, and then I just figured it out. And then after that, another person, I posted it. Another person wanted it. Another person wanted it. Another person. And it just grew organically from that. So All right. it everything, but mostly drinking games. Ha, well, <laughs> everybody's got their fun. It's all good. Right. <laughs> and then with the, the drop shipping stuff, how did you figure out what to even sell? Um, so it was, I would just scroll through each product and anything that caught my eye, I knew it would catch someone else's eye. So um, I just, I started on looking at, you know, a brand or, you know, soaps and then um, like shower stuff. And then, you know, then I was like, okay, I, I got to keep it like in a specific industry. And I picked the like lamps, lighting. Um, All so right. There's like these little strawberry silicone lamps that looked really cool. Um, then there's like these, these O shaped lamps that look pretty cool. Um, the ring lights. The, the so you got a lava lamp behind you like oh yeah that. can't go wrong with a lava lamp <laughs> exactly and i just i just took the pictures there and put them on my website and that's how I, that's how i picked it so with aliexpress this stuff is coming out of china yeah so would it take months or weeks or anything to get that's why i don't do it anymore <laughs> oh okay because everybody we want stuff this afternoon, right? Yeah. So it At wasn't best. it wasn't a viable business model. You know, you don't get any repeat customers because you're gonna get you know you get an order and then it shows up on their doorstep four months later. All uh, right. So Thanks. <laughs> Forgot yeah. I ordered this. Right. Exactly. So and it might show up broken and I I would not be able to take returns. Like I didn't I didn't offer returns. It was just uh, oh wow okay. But I used it. it, it the thing that it taught me was Facebook and Instagram ads. All right. And, on those and that's exactly the skill that i needed for that specific moment in time sure tell me just let everybody understands timeline of when this is happening what year is all this happening yeah so this is actually relatively recent this is um let's see this is 2021 all right okay so in the pandemic ish right yeah pretty much all right interesting now i imagine were you were you playing ball then so um 2021 we played baseball that season okay then uh, come around to the next season 2022 about a year ago i retired so gotcha. okay yep. all right and then so you're building the website and did you build a website and all the ads and stuff like that or did you outsource that no i built all of it so i did the i did a shopify store um and then i you know just made the shopify store you know i took all the pictures myself um i actually took them from online so i didn't even i didn't use a camera or anything nice. um, all right and then built the store out um bought the url um and then yeah just linked it to a paypal account all right and that's how I brought payments and that's how i did it huh. and how many strawberry lamps or whatever did you end up selling was it enough to make a living off of or is it enough to learn about just business I could change yeah it, it wasn't it wasn't enough to make a full-time living but it was it was I was profitable okay yeah. all right and did you have a bunch of links or um yeah, web so names essentially so you have super awesome <laughs> and yeah, would, the other super awesome lamp.com or something like that yeah so I would actually I would go and find, find a bunch of different products a bunch of different links and uh and I'd put them on and uh that was pretty much how I would do it all right all right but that's not something that you're still doing no, it's not. It's not. <laughs> it just, it was good. Chalk it up to experience. Move on. Yep. That was, uh, yeah, it was a stepping stone. I, it was just great. It was great to learn how to run ads. Yeah. Oh my gosh. The marketing is the name of the game, right? Yep. Two things to be successful in business, innovation, and marketing, and a strong argument could be made. I believe that marketing trumps innovation because I don't, I don't know about you, but I've seen a lot of companies that are successful that I don't know if they innovate at all. But yeah, I mean, yeah. certainly do market. Spend the most on the consumer, you win, right? Yeah, that's the name of the game. That is the name of the game. It's not who's best, it's who's best at bringing awareness. Exactly, yep. So you private business investor, how does that come into play here? 
Yeah. So uh, once I retired, I knew I didn't want to do any more strawberry lamps. I knew I wanted to do something bigger. Um, and I knew I, I already had the stepping stones to start something else. I didn't know if I wanted to start a business. Um, you know, I, I was at the point in time where I was thinking, why not? Why not just buy a business? Uh -huh. uh, and so I started looking around, you know, you don't how I do it and how I came up, you know, with all my coaches and teammates you know, before you go do something, you have a coach tell you how to do it. Someone that's already done it, tell you how to do it. So I started looking around for like coaches, mentors to teach me how to buy a business, what I should be looking for, how to do it. Um, and I found a few. And so what I did was started reaching out to these people and just said, Hey, um, you know, former professional baseball player, I'm looking to buy a business. How do I do it? What should I do? What should I look for? Um, and you know, that's, Pretty much how I found all my contacts. And then um, one of them sent me a link to go to a convention and I went up to that convention. And that's that alone, that whole room has just been so beneficial to me. The connections, the network that I've got involved with has been unbelievable. All right. So the convention, did it have a bunch of businesses for sale or what did it have? It was just a bunch of uh, M and A investors, so mergers and acquisitions investors, people that are like minded doing the same thing in small business. And um, mind you, these are people that are, you know, 20, 30 years ahead of me in the field that are just, you know, still kicking it, still having a blast, still doing a lot of great, really cool things and providing a ton of value. All right. So is the idea, I mean, well, I guess maybe you should just tell me the idea before I guess <laughs> I don't know. with this, oh. with these people, are they buying businesses to keep or buying businesses to flip or buying businesses to build and flip? Yeah, it's that's the beauty of it. It's you can pick. It's kind of like real estate. You know, you, there's so many different aspects to it. M&A, there's so many different aspects to it. So you have, you know, your private private equity firms and they're looking at, you know, buying these businesses, maybe doing a roll up strategy. So they'll buy up, you know, the entire industry. Um, they'll do a platform company and then do maybe a vertical uh, integration or vertical integration, then horizontal or you know, and they'll they'll do all kinds of strategic acquisitions. There's guys like me that are just sole investors looking for a business to buy for themselves. After that, you know, after you accomplish that, you can go in any direction you want. You could, you know, make that one more profitable, flip it. You could, you know, buy another one. You, it, there's really just a lot of different opportunities out there for you. So there's, you know, the turnaround guys, there's the growth experts, there's the exit experts. You know, it's the same thing. You can do, you can go wherever you want. All right. And what have you been successful with? Yeah. So I actually, I've been trying and JVing mostly with, with the experts that the business needs. So how I've been going about it, and this is just how I've been doing it. Um, I'm not the most experienced in this field. I just started, I'm coming up on a year in it actually. All right. So when I talk to a business owner, you know, it'd be naive for me to say, oh, I know, I know what you're doing wrong. I can see yeah, it, right. but they've been doing it for 40 years. So what I do is I go find the person that does know that. And, you know, ge generally they're an investor too. And so I loop them in and then we, we work on a deal together as far as if they're looking to exit, if they're looking to grow, we just try and solve their problem with a deal. And that's how we go. That's how we do it. All right. So it's interesting to compare the real estate with the business. Yeah. Because real estate, you're like, Hey, that's a house I can physically tangibly see it right i can see if there's termites i can see if how many bedrooms bathrooms all that jazz where it's located with a yeah. business and i like to think or believe that my business is pretty well run and i like to believe that i have all my documents in order but i know from teaching business planning classes and stuff like that i would most of those small businesses don't even know what they're doing wrong as far as having stuff in order right and you so don't, I, you don't know. yeah like i can look at a house and i can say like okay this is the value of that house as is and if we fix it up this is where we can expect it to be with a business how do you figure out the value of a business when a lot of times you're either taking the business's owner or the owner's word for it or you're looking at their their accounting maybe you're taking the accountant's word for it like yeah. how do you figure out the value and even more so the potential value of that business. Right. And so business valuation, you know, this comes from one of my mentors, but business valuation is sort of a dark art. You know, mm -hmm. you, can, you can argue day and night, you know, based off of the 300 
million different ways to value a business. You can, you, there's so many different ways you can go off revenue, you can go off profits, you can go off EBITDA multiples, you can go off whatever you want really. But that, at the end of the day, it comes down to what the owner wants to sell the business for. Mm -hmm. And so when I, I don't try and get hung up on the valuation, if I'm really trying to get a deal done, I just focus on what they want, what there's, what the number is. And oftentimes they don't know, they really don't know what, it, what they want. And you start to help them figure out, Hey, this is what the future looks like. This, this is what I want to exit for. This will take care of me for the rest of my life. I need this. I need that. And then that's how you value the business. That is taking care of their owner, uh, of the owner. Um, but some of the smaller businesses, if you take the owner out, they are the business. You know, I've had, right, a, few, yeah. I've had a few deals fall through um, where the owners, you know, I had to put some of the money on the other side of the deal. So they would be invested in teaching me how to run the business versus just giving them all the cash up front and telling them, hey, see ya. Because then yeah, I'd, be good stuck, luck. I'd be stuck with it. You know, I wouldn't yeah. know what to do. It, and my investment would not be protected then. So there is a fine line. If you can't replace yourself in the business, they will ask you to stick around and mm -hmm. do an earn out payment. Gotcha. Fair. Yeah, I've uh, interviewed quite a few business exit help people. Um, and I've sold a business. I've helped some people buy and sell businesses. And it's so interesting because I feel like every transaction that I've either learned about or been a part of, there's always been some interesting <laughs> twist or some due diligence that went awry either direction or the, I guess the most fun I've seen, the most exciting thing I've seen is some people put these little things in their, in the agreement for, I guess the one that I'm thinking of is the seller put something in the agreement. She had had the business for so long that people were constantly coming to her and she was smart enough to know that people are going to come to her. That would be mean new business for the buyer. So she set up a little commission so that when she sends a new customer to this, the new owner that she gets a little nut. I'm like, Oh my gosh, that's genius. Yeah. Which is, I mean, just little stuff like that where, I mean, when you compare that to a real estate transaction, I don't know. What are you going to say? Anytime somebody walks in front of the house, I get a commission or something. Right. And that's, that's the thing. It, it's so deep. It goes so much deeper. Um, it, you can do, you can get very creative with this. It's, yeah. it's really an art form. It really is. So yeah, that's cool. Are there certain industries that you aim for? And like I said, it's stuff that I, un, I can understand, you know, okay. I'm not i I'm not crazy about, you know, software. I've just, and I didn't, I'm not in that industry, you know, uh, Y Combinator, they, they really stick behind startup guys that have industry experience. Mm -hmm. So me not having, me having baseball as my experience, um, I have to rely on a team and most of my, most of my contacts are not in software. So it's generally blue collar businesses, stuff that I can understand. Um, you, you know, if you can describe it in a sentence, that's probably something I'm interested in. But gotcha. more so size. So I go after businesses that are doing one million in revenue to ten million in revenue, and uh, generally that size has a, a management team in place. Um, okay. So I rely pretty heavily on the employees to get me around the ins and outs of the industry, and uh, yeah, that's what I look at. All right. Have you had any success stories already? Yeah. So I've done I've done one deal. Um, that's a a percentage of revenue. Um, I'm in Philadelphia, so it's it's up here. It's over here in Philadelphia. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that, that one's pretty interesting. That's how I've been uh, having some, some solid income so far. Um, we'll see what happens. Uh, there's some, a good shakeup in the industry, uh, these past few days. So it, you know, it's relatively interesting. Right. Um, not a most, bank or anything, right? No, no, it's, uh, yeah, it's not a bank, but right. you know, I look at everything I'm trying to move down to Florida. So I'm looking at everything down in Florida. Um, the idea is to get out of the cold weather. Ah, you're a smart man. Yeah. I'm in Wisconsin and I've been trying to get out of cold weather my entire life. Yeah. So yep. my wife uh, is not a fan of moving. So <laughs> I got to keep tap dancing there. Yeah. Try to talk her yeah. into that. So when you, when you see this deal, let's just say with this Philadelphia deal, was that a deal that you found or that your mentor said, Hey, we got to check this thing out. No. So the, the, like the very first skill you need to, to, is to find be able to find deals. So um, you can go to those biz buy sell websites. You can go to brokers, but this one I actually just reached out to directly. 
Um, and the owner told me no, like three times. Oh, wow. And so I, we pivoted from, you know, a hundred percent buyout to, you know, uh, me trying to help him grow the business via marketing. And he said no to that, to me trying to help him acquire his competitors. Um, he was like, eh, I don't know about that. And we, you know, we settled on a percentage of revenue. Um, right. I won't go into the specifics of the deal just because of NDAs and stuff. Right, but, right, right. And it just shows you like, no starts the negotiation. And I think that's so important. That's the biggest thing that I've learned this up to this point is like, no means like, sometimes it means no, but don't get me wrong. Don't get me, don't right. put me in jail. But um, it starts everything because that really gets to the root cause of what's actually happening. Yeah. I don't know of any business owner that if you, well, I guess what I mean to say is there's no business owner that I can think of that if they were given a bag of money of a certain volume that they would say, nah. Now, some business owners, that bag of money has to be bigger, smaller, whatever, right? Everyone's got their, their price yeah. as far as that goes. But I think, I believe that most business owners aren't assuming that they're going to work the same business until they die. Right. I would hope that that's the case, that they know that they have to exit it sometime. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen a lot. I've covered a lot of ground and the, the business owners that don't want to exit are the, actually the businesses that are, are the ones that they should exit. You know, they are the ones uh -huh. that everything's going really well, but once things are finally going well, you know, business is tough when things are finally going well. Um, that's when they're like, well, no way. This thing's spitting out cash now. <laughs> uh, right. And so it's kind of a paradigm. Every, every reason you don't sell is actually every reason you don't want to sell is the reason you should sell. And I, I was just on the phone yesterday with a gentleman. He didn't want to sell his, uh, it was a screen door company and he didn't, he didn't want to sell it because it's spitting out cash. And I said, that's the reason you should, you know, you get a higher <laughs> multiple on that. But yeah, um, I agree. I've, I've, I've come across a, a ton of businesses and, you know, I don't understand why they wouldn't. Got it. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, everybody I think should have an exit plan if they don't. But it shows you that it's more emotional than anything. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, you could argue that with just about any purchase, right? Well, buy emotionally and justify logically yeah. with just about anything. But I feel like with business owners, you're dealing with some ego there. There's, because yeah. in order to start your own business, you got to have a little bit of an ego. There's, I mean, to a point, there's nothing wrong with that. It's necessary. That is, yeah, especially to get through the uh, the dog days of starting it, starting one yeah, up. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Totally. So then you're dealing with someone that's pretty strong willed. Mm -hmm. And I suppose you'll run into someone that's. They said no, so they feel like they should be stubborn about that no, even though maybe it's not even in their best interest to say no. Yeah. So, yeah, that's that's that one. Interesting. So you spend a lot of your time, it sounds like, reaching out to business owners and just trying to get a feel for yeah, well, if it's I, worth pursuing the conversation. Yeah, pursuing the conversation. But I've also realized, you know, it, it's you have to you have to you're not, you know, you know die hard pursuing it. It's not like you're chasing everyone down to buy their business. Mm -hmm. It's more like a, you know, off the back foot type thing because it, it is a sensitive thing. It is, you want to, you want to cater to that. They've been uh, a lot of business owners. They've been spending their entire lives in each business. So you want to respect that and you don't want to just send them a million solicitations, cold emails, cold calls. Um, you you got to respect their boundaries a little bit and, and approach it in a respectful way. So I, yeah. I generally spend most of my time, uh, on the phone meeting with people that have responded to me. All right, cool. And you, are you just, I want almost said going through the yellow pages. Are you going through, uh, the web searches or something like that? Or who are you figuring out who to call or how are you figuring out who to call? Yeah. So, I mean, million different ways to approach it. Um, you know, you can get really creative here. Um, I like to go on the Facebook groups. That's a good one. Um, if you go on to, uh, you know, uh, public library databases, so you can access these like pretty nice databases via the public library. So you just go online, code, it. they put them all online. So you just get a library card, you get through. Um, and that is, those give you solid, you know, lists. All uh, right. You might have to clean them up a little bit, but sure. yeah, you can do all kinds of stuff. There's Apollo.io. That's good for cold email. Um, all right. Everything. Very cool. And the blue collar stuff that you're going after now, is this blue collar service, like electricians, plumbers type thing, or is it blue collar 
manufacturing? Uh, yeah, so I've, I've talked with all three, you know, that you just mentioned. I've talked all with right. manufacturing businesses, talked with printing companies, I've talked to plumbers, talked to uh, plumbing supply businesses, uh, talked with HVAC, talked with cabinets. Um, I've, I've talked with marketing agencies. I've talked with, um, you know, telecoms. I've talked, you know, so it's not just blue collar, but it is, you know, mostly in that space. You know, B2B services are also pretty big as well. Gotcha. So when you, let's just say you call up Joe the plumber and Joe answers and you're like, Joe, what's up? I want to buy your business or whatever. I'm sure the script is a little smoother than that. Yeah. And Joe's like, sure, come on over. Check out the, the documents and all that jazz. And you go there and he's got shoe boxes full of receipts. And he's like, eh, this is what I think I'm making, whatever. How do you figure out the value just of the business itself when Joe may be a good plumber? And I'm sure he's got some employees or something like that. He's probably making a decent living, but you don't really know exactly how decent of a living he's making for what you're buying. How do you yeah, figure that so out? This is where this is where it's taken me a little bit to understand that there's still an opportunity there. Um, so you just outlined the business isn't ready for a sale, and you know I, I haven't done this just quite yet, but I've seen people are, are doing this at a wholesale level. They're they just go into these businesses, and when they come across something like this, they would say, "Hey, you know, obviously there's a lot of work to be done to get this ready for a sale." Obviously, there's a lot of work to be done to get you the value that you really believe is in the business. And so let me help you get the business ready for a sale. And there's a ton of guys now that are doing that. And they go into the business, they run through the receipts, they, they get the shoe boxes out of the way, and they help prep and get the business ready for a sale. Interesting. Then do they end up taking a percentage of the sale or how do they get paid? Yeah, so they'll they'll actually either they'll take it through an exit. At that point, they'll either help take it through an exit by helping find a buyer because they're obviously investors as well. They have a good network, so they just loop in. Um, they'll probably do like a retainer and equity, um, you know, just to make sure they get a percentage of the exit or buy the business from them then. Oh, um, interesting. Okay. Yeah. They've so gone they through all the shoe boxes and figured out like, wait a second, this is actually cool. Yeah. And so, you know, if you like what you see, you know, there's there's a path there and in that way you have that trust already being built too so gotcha very cool you mentioned the e2e things so let's shift into that yeah so uh like i said um at one of my first uh m a seminar conventions i went up to at one of the breaks um sir aaron jacklin um he he's uh, actually doing acquisitions in the accounting space um, he's also on a board member of EXP Realty. Um, oh, sure. Okay. Yeah, he's yeah, he's he's high up. Um and uh, you know, very accomplished individual, very enthusiastic. He was speaking on stage and he was falling like he was falling off the stage because he was so excited talking. <laughs> and he gave such a great presentation that you know, afterwards he was in the in the lobby and everyone's grabbing coffee and no one's talking to him because he's off to the side. So I just walked up to him and was like, hey. This is where I'm at. My name is Ryan. This is what I'm trying to do. How do I get there? And immediately he's like, you know, well, I commend you for coming up to me. And this is what we're going to do. And so he put me in contact with a few people, um, you know, got me in the pyramid club at the, at, in Philadelphia and met David Meltzer up there. Um, and just, he just immediately boosted my network. Um, and then, uh, you know, as, as I went, he reached out again and he said, Hey, we got this thing going on. Um, we're putting a superstar team together. We'd love for you to be a part of it. Um, and I didn't know what it was, but it, lo and behold, it was Elevate to Educate. And so what Elevate to Educate is, it's the hiking fundraising arm of the LY2NK Foundation. Um, and so the whole premise is to do hiking fundraisers to raise money for LY2NK. All right. And remind, tell me, what is LYN2K? So that is um, Sir Darren Jacklin. It's it's a it's a bigger uh, organization that has already done extensive work in Africa. So they built a school over there. And so Sir da Darren Jacklin's wife, I believe Tatiana, she's um, runs that, and she's been doing a fabulous job. Um, All right. E two E is pretty much just funding that, so they can continue to do their work. Gotcha. So E two E is a fundraiser, or what? It, tell me exactly what E two E does. 
So Elevate to Educate is the hiking fundraiser arm. So what Elevate to Educate is what we're aiming to do is put hiking fundraisers up across the United States. And I think we're going to have, have one in, in Canada soon. So we're going to just put fundraisers together, raise money through those events, have bands come out. You know, it's going to be a hike and then, a, you know, a festival at the end. Um, and so we'll just have a bunch of awareness there and then uh, raise money that way. Got it. When you said a hiking fundraiser, I'm just going through my brain like, what is a hiking fundraiser? Yeah, but it's like, literally hiking right. and it's a fundraiser. Right. It's okay. hiking and fundraising. Yeah. Got it. So you guys go to parks and stuff like that? Or like, what kind yeah. of hike are we talking about here? Yeah. So we, we had one scheduled uh, and we just recently pushed it back. It was going to be on Mother's Day in May. And we pushed it back to this year. I think we're going to try and get it done in September. Okay. Um, we had, we had, it was going to be, or I think it is going to be in Denver, Colorado. Um, and it's just going to be like a flat trail. You know, they have a bunch of trails out there. It's probably just going to be a flat trail. And then at the very end, have a band perform and have, you know, vendors, local vendors uh, set up shops and everything and, and go through it like that. Gotcha. So when you guys put these hiking fundraisers up, how much money does, are you hoping to gain? And then what do you end up doing with that money? Um, yeah. So I, I don't actually know that yet. Um, okay. We'll find think, out, <laughs> right? Yeah, I'll find out though. I'll I'll, I'll figure that out. Um, but yeah, it's it's they, it, they're looking to go pretty big. I think they're they're throwing around some some big band names that everyone knows. So gotcha. Okay, so to the point where people are maybe flying or traveling in to go to this fundraiser, so that they can do the hike, fundraise, yeah. see a band kind of thing, or see this special band, whatever. Okay, exactly. so you're not talking hundreds of dollars. You're talking thousands of dollars of fundraising. Yes. All right. Very cool. And then once you get that money that goes to the place in Africa or what happens with the cash then? Um, so I believe they're looking to either build another school or uh, begin to build out, you know, servicing that one school. So um, a big problem over there right now in Africa is the plumbing. Mm. Uh, it, it's it just, you know, if you don't have accurate and good, clean plumbing, um, then having, you know, all these schools built, you know, it really doesn't do too much. So, right. um, you know, trying to build on the infrastructure that's already there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also, you know, by doing that and having a, you know, a community there, you start to um, eliminate some of the other problems that are surrounding the, the, the school. Gotcha. You know, it's funny you mentioned that because I was just talking to someone today, a uh, different podcast actually about, um, we're talking about perfection, striving for perfection, unachievable, blah, 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 blah. Um, but it came down to still be your goal. And then we talked about how a lot of people, um, these are some students that I had in a business planning class that I did years ago. Um, she just, this woman came to me and she's like, I can't do my homework. Or I didn't do my homework. And her homework was essentially just putting together her business plan. We assigned them little chunks of the business plan. It was an eight week thing. So one eighth of her business plan was essentially her homework. She comes back and she's like, I didn't have internet. I'm like, what do you mean you didn't have internet? Right. You didn't like, we got a library, we got coffee shops, all this kind of stuff. And it's interesting. You think like that was her little excuse. Right. But plumbing wasn't an issue for her. Weather, comfort in the house, shelter wasn't the problem. So it's interesting when you think about people in different parts of the world and what they consider challenges. Versus what a lot of people in the States here consider challenges. We still may be saying, hey, it can't happen. But I understand like, hey, it can't happen because I'm sick because I don't have clean water. Is a way different story than I'm too lazy to go to the library. Yeah. And, you know, that's the, uh, you know, that's a lot of entrepreneurs know that feeling too, though. <laughs> you know, yeah. You, oh, yeah. You can't, you, if, if you don't have internet connection, you know, you, you find, you just figure it out. Um, so sometimes. That's, that's it right there. Yeah. Just figure it out. Figure Sometimes it, out. it is just having your feet held to the fire that really helps you figure it out. But mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it was funny because I was kind of, I was prodding her a little bit and I had to be careful because I didn't want to make her too mad. It was one of those, like, if this is what's stopping you now, imagine what happens when you actually have your business and a real problem shows up, a problem that you are going to have a harder time solving than just walking to the library. Right. Like, what are you going to do then? Because you were always going to have problems. It's just fact of life. Problems are a sign of life. So to say like, I don't have internet. Right. Like what? 
So that's interesting. But then going back to the Africa thing, Selvin Water Supply, that is a huge undertaking. Holy cow. Yeah. So, you know, obviously, um, you know, I think Sir Darren would be able to give you a lot more accurate info. Mm -hmm. uh, this is just based off of my, you know, short stint of a few months sure. know, involved with them. Yeah. Got it. So have you, I guess, over the course of the year, what are some of the things that you've learned that you didn't even know were things? Um, working off the back foot, you know, not being too incredibly eager, um, you know, in, in negotiations, if you go in and you're too needy, mm -hmm. it, it, it shows. So, um, you know, I call it working off the back foot, but just not showing neediness to get a deal done. All uh, right. Also, you know, the time horizons, you know, things take a long time. Um, you know, especially great things. So if you're doing, if you're doing something that you want to do for the rest of your life, then, you know, you shouldn't worry about how long it takes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that I believe that to be true as well with business, you know, you, if you extend it over a long enough time, time horizon, you will eventually get there. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, you you won't learn unless you are you know you're forcing yourself to learn so actually spending the money on marketing spending the money on yourself investing in yourself taking courses finding mentors um that's the only way to do it i don't think you can really just you know learn by not expending putting stuff investing stuff into it mm -hmm. uh, there'd be sweat equity or cash so I, um, that was a double jointed thing you know invest in your marketing just to figure it out just you know throw money at it and you'll force yourself to learn. Second thing, find mentors that have done it before you to get there faster. Yeah. Uh, just ask them for help. Chances are, if you're hungry, they'll help you. Fair, totally fair. So tell me about finding mentors. How did you find or choose the mentors that you have? So I knew if I could find good enough deals that those mentors would have no problem uh, working with me. Oh, and smart. And so my value that I bring is I'm good at finding good deals. So I, you know, it didn't start this way and I'm still working on finding better deals, but you know, the deals that I do bring to the table, um, you know, I reach out to like the best of the best that I can get my hands on the people that I can reach out to. And I say, Hey, I'm, you know, pretty, I'm not in, pretty inexperienced. You got to choose your wording. Right. Um, but Hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm working on this. I could really use your experience. I think the business owner could use your experience here. You know, would you do a joint venture with me? And then we hop on a call. They see, you know, I'm not just some sleaze bag or something like that. <laughs> right. And then, uh, you know, that's how I get these mentors. Another thing, um, I talked with a, a COO of a private equity fund. I just offered to say, hey, how much for an hour of your time? Um, so I offered to pay for his time. And, you know, he said like 400 bucks. And so, you know, that might sound like a lot, but I just paid him the 400 bucks. And he told me, how they do all of their debt financing for each deal. He showed me everything for that whole hour. I have the spreadsheets, I have the formulas, I have the percentages, I have the contacts. Nice. I'm actually working on a few deals with them as well. So um, I think if you just reach out and you, you ask, hey, how much for your time mm -hmm. and make sure they're the right person um, and you pay them, they're going to give you everything because they feel now feel they have to deliver to you. Yeah. You know, it's interesting you say that because when it comes down to value, an issue you're probably thinking $400, but you probably got $40,000 worth of value right there. Exactly. And, you know, it, for that 40, that 400 bucks might make me a lot more money. And also, yeah. like, he, he's in his head, like, wow, I didn't expect this guy to actually pay. <laughs> right. and so now he, Who is this guy? What's the $400 worth? Like, yeah. here we go. This is what I'm doing. This is how to do yeah. it. And go get her. I love it. And then, yeah, and so you get to, you get to say, and the, my favorite question when I do this is say, okay, this is where I'm at. How would you do this? All right. And then they just walk you through everything that they would be doing. Mm -hmm. So uh, imagine how valuable this is. Someone that's a step above you, where you want to go, telling you exactly how they're going to navigate where you are right now. That's awesome. So it's, it's a hack. Yeah, I think it's a hack. Yeah, that's super cool. So what is some advice that you've learned that you would like to share with some people they were thinking about going off on their own and whatever entrepreneurial journey they're starting. Um, yeah, I think uh, you might just have to send it. <laughs> <I> think, <laughs> but, you know, if you, if you find, sometimes you don't know what you want to do. Um, and I think that comes from you not knowing what you're good at. If you're really good at something, you might, you might 
be, you know, a little bit more inclined to do that thing. Um, you know, like I wasn't really good at catching in baseball, so I didn't, I didn't <laughs> like it too much. I loved shortstop. I was a good shortstop. Sure. Um, so m- my advice would, would be to just invest in yourself. You know, I think, I think that's the hot trend on social media right now with the entrepreneurship world. Um, but you know, read books on stuff, you know, don't, mm-hmm. don't just sit there and, Oh, that's another thing. Break it down into each step and each skill you need to learn to get it accomplished. And then read books on the step, go on podcasts, figure out who's done that step and pay for their time. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, you'll find out soon that that won't be your bottleneck anymore. It shifts to something else. And uh, if you do it for a long enough time, you'll have success. Gotcha. Very cool. So where do you see this business going then it, for your world? Let's say three, five years down the road. Yeah. Three to five years down the road, I'm hoping to have a, a few, few acquisitions done mm-hmm. um, and potential a few exits done. Um, right now, I, I think um, it, I would be foolish not to focus on distressed acquisitions too. Mm-hmm. Uh, so hopefully have a few turnarounds to help some business owners out. Yeah. Um, I think that would be wise based up based on the times, based on what we're, what we're seeing. Uh, <laughs> right. But yeah, I think the three to five year plan is to, uh, you know, do a good job at what I'm doing right now, master today and you know, let the chips fall where they might. Yeah, fair. Totally fair. It's interesting talking to people that are a little bit younger that didn't necessarily experience the 2008 stuff. Yeah. Because it's kind of like, what are we going through? And I'm like, oh, this is nothing. <laughs> this is. Well, I'm hoping, I, you know, I always, I always look to, you know, those the entrepreneurs that made it through the 2008 yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, and COVID, mm-hmm. you know, you can see like you can you can tell who who's been who's who really um, because, you know, they don't really bat an eye. So, you know, yeah. hopefully it's just one of those like from my perspective, big issues, challenges, world changing type stuff happens roughly every eight to ten years, roughly. And it's one of those things where like sometimes you got to weed out the, the junk. Yeah. So, and sometimes when you're weeding, you catch some good stuff too accidentally, but plus it kind of keeps it interesting. I mean, for better or worse, right? We don't, I always say nobody gets excited on a flat roller coaster. <laughs> so right. they call those trains, right? So yeah, I guess that's one of those that it, it just gives you something to enjoy. Yeah. A little bit. At least maybe after the fact. You can look back and say, see what I survived, the single thing. Yeah, made it through, survived. Fair. So, Ryan, I don't know if it's going to be too forward or not, but if someone is listening to this and they're interested in exiting their business, can they reach out to you? Yeah, reach on out. Um, right. You know, Go on my website, Um, Reach out to me on LinkedIn, connect me on LinkedIn. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, my email, or there's a, I have an online form on my website to fill that out. Um, we'll have a phone call. Um, if I can't help you exit, you know, I'll, I'll put you in contact with someone that will, yeah. uh, you know, so what, like I said, you know, I have a good network now. It's been, uh, it's been growing. So nice. Let's, let's have a chat and, uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah. I mean, worst case is not a good fit. Best case <laughs> money's exchanged. Best. People are happy, yeah. right? Win-win on both sides. Yeah. That's pretty cool. It's impressive that after just a year, which in, which realistically is not that long. That yeah. you come so far, even to have a deal under your belt is impressive. Yeah. And I think it, I, I really believe that the hack of trying to find someone ahead of you and paying for their time to have them tell you, I think that's what's been doing it. Nice. Um, so. Very cool. That's impressive. Well, I wish you great luck in the future. This is super cool. Thanks, James. I appreciate it. This has been Authentic Business Adventures, the business program that brings you the struggle stories and triumphant successes of business owners across the land. We're locally underwritten by the Bank of Sun Prairie. If you are listening or watching this on the web, if you could do us a huge favor to let the algorithms know that we're cool or that we shared some information that you can use, right? Thumbs up, subscribe, and of course, comment below. Let us know about the acquisitions that you've had, maybe the sales that you've had, or just let Ryan know that you're interested in getting a bag of money from him. I don't know, whatever works, right? My name is James Kateman and Authentic Business Adventures is brought to you by Calls on Call, offering call answering and receptionist services for service businesses across the country on the web at callsoncall.com. And of course, the Bold Business Book, a book for the entrepreneur in all of us, available wherever fine books are sold. We'd like to thank you, our wonderful listeners, as well as our guest, Ryan Ogrand, 
we got the founder of Rhino LLC, professional or past professional baseball player, as well as, and this is the important one, private business investor. So, Ryan, can you tell us your website one more time? Yep, uh, www.ryanogren.com. Um, just my name. And then uh, you just connect with me on LinkedIn, Ryan Ogren. Cool. I love it. Past episodes can be found morning, noon, and night. The podcast link found at drawincustomers.com. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next week. I want you to stay awesome. And if you do nothing else, enjoy your business. Mm-hmm.